Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the afternoon session of the second day of the conference. So, we are very happy to have Andreas Damiano and uh, Neil Lawrence here today, who are the recipients of the AI Stats Test of Time Award for their paper, Deep Gaussian Processes. Now, the Test of Time Award is given to a paper that was published 10 years ago at AI Stats. Uh, and so, in this case, this is AI Stats 2013. And back then we had a grand total of about 70 papers, of which six were published as notable papers. And what I think is interesting is that, you know, this work by Andreas and Neil was actually not amongst these papers. And I guess this serves as a lesson that it's very difficult for current committees to predict future impact, right? Uh, by now, however, uh, I think the impact of the deep Gaussian processes work has been kind of undeniable. Uh, Andreas and Neil's work showed how it was possible to stack Gaussian processes into kind of multiple layers in a way that's kind of, I guess, established a connection with, with deep learning. Uh, and this has been a very influential idea and it's inspired a host of follow-on work and the paper continues to be cited to this day. So Andreas and Neil, why don't you come up here? We have some certificates for you. Um, uh, let's all congratulate them on this well-deserved award. So we're going to take a quick moment to uh, to pose for a couple of pictures, and then uh, they will give their talk. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Which way? Maybe the gentleman in the center. You guys up the middle. You're going like that or like this. All right. Every day can be a better day despite the challenge. All you gotta do. All right, the stage is all yours. So I'm going to start and Andreas is going to take over. I'm going to do the emotional teary bit um, where uh, you sort of state what an amazing privilege it is for your absolute favorite conference to have given you such an award and uh, to get it with one of your... Um, well, one of your amazing students, all students are amazing. Um, so there's this sort of question like, how do you deal with such awards? What, what should your talk involve? And uh, Andreas is going to actually do some of the review of the technical ideas in the paper. But what I'm going to do is just set, set the context a little bit uh, for the background to the paper. Um, and I want to do that by going back to how I got into machine learning. So. I was a mechanical engineer as an undergraduate, and my first job after school was working in oil rigs, and this is the actual oil rig I worked on. It's called the Trident 14, and I was on that rig in 1995 in Liverpool Bay, which is, I think, where that picture's taken from as it was drilling in the uh, Lennox oil field. And there was no internet, and there's a lot of downtime on oil rigs, so I used to read The New Scientist. And I don't know if this is exactly, I found this cover from the period I was on the rig. Um, this is a new scientist from December 1995, and it's saying, machines with a spark of genius. And there were a lot of articles in these magazines about these new phenomena called neural networks. This one, is, I looked at this one, and this one is about, apparently machines one day will actually be creative. <laughs> you won't believe it. So I, I knew I didn't want to spend my whole career working on oil fields. I enjoyed engineering. I enjoyed solving problems. And the reason these two things come together is because we were doing data acquisition from the rig. So actually, this is a picture of the plan of that same rig. So this object here was my logging unit. And this is the drill floor. And I used to run a cable from here to here and acquire data from the oil well. And I used to sit next to a geologist who would interpret this data. And I would think to myself, oh, I'd like to learn how to interpret that data. And I'd ask them these rules about how to do it, and then I would try and do it. And they said, no, 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 that's an exception. And it sounded to me like these neural networks were this really interesting technology that could perhaps capture and emulate what this geologist was doing. And so that's how I ended up going to do a PhD. Now, this picture is a picture of me in 1996, August 6 or 7. It's the machine learning and generalization summer school that was held at the Newton Institute that year. And the reason why I want to bring this in is because one of the themes that I want to highlight here is community. And 
What I found when I joined the neural networks community as was the connectionists at that time was not just a set of really interesting ideas, but a set of really interesting, welcoming, intellectually lively people. And I got to go to that meeting and I got to hear Jan LeCun talk about convolutional neural networks, Lynette Five. I got to see Jeff Hinton talk about what he told us was the way the brain worked. And it was something called the hierarchical community of experts. Something I learned then is the first time Jeff Hinton tells you how the brain works, right? That's the time you really believe that that's how it works. The second time, you're a bit disappointed he's not still sticking with his story the first time, but you never forget the first time Jeff tells you how the brain works. And that's where I heard how the brain works. Hierarchical community of experts, Brian Salins and Jeff Hinton. Um, what I also found out there is I was, I was hearing about all these sort of very interesting new models. I mean, so it's funny, I, I, I live and work in Cambridge now. This is how the Newton Institute looks now. My hair's shorter but the trees are taller. <laughs> so that's 25 years ago. But it made a very, very strong impression on me, the quality of this meeting that I attended. And I think the thing I want to emphasize about this paper and is that it's not a paper that exists on its own by some idea that Andreas and I came up with. It sits within a broader scope of community of people who worried about ideas or agreed something was interesting to work on. And very quickly, I myself sort of got into that. Because one of the things that was presented at that meeting, and I'd been all into Gauss, uh, to neural networks, was this new method of Gaussian processes. And it was very apparent that Gaussian processes were the future. Uh, and that neural networks were just not going to be the way of doing things. Because of all these interesting qualities um, of uh, Uncertainty representation. So obviously, I, I think most of this audience understand the Gaussian process. This is a Gaussian process interpolating through three data points. Um, and of course, we're showing samples from the process. But the remarkable thing about the Gaussian process is you can do this quite complex Bayesian inference with very high dimensional integrals just through linear algebra because of the properties of the Gaussian. And that was mind blowing to me because that is absolutely the right way of solving the problems I was worrying about on the oil rig, right? No, no other way. In fact, they're very widely used um, in. Uh, Geospatial modeling, of course. Um, so I was quite surprised sort of one year later when David Mackay, who was also in Cambridge, I met him for the first time at the Newton Institute, gave, he gave a tutorial at the Newton Institute as part of that six month program that was led by Chris Bishop, but he also gave a tutorial at Neurips that year. Uh, so it must have been 97, actually. Um, and this is his write up of that tutorial where he sort of said, according to the hype of 1987, I like the fact that it's the hype of 1987. Um, Neural networks meant to be intelligent models that discover features and patterns in data. Gaussian processes, in contrast, are simply smoothing devices. How can Gaussian processes possibly replace neural networks? What's going on? And of course, David, in 1997, is actually predicting what the problem is with such models, that they aren't extracting the type of features we need. So they're brilliant interpolators, Gaussian processes, but what we're getting with deep learning is the capability to create a landscape within which to interpolate. And that's really interesting. So there's a number of people that sort of influence thinking on this, my own thinking on this, including Jeff Hinton and others. But a large part of that was a community that we started to form around these methods. And this was an early workshop. This is the first workshop. This is why PMLR exists, by the way, because I wrote to Springer saying, would you publish this workshop? And they wrote a really smarty email back. So I wrote to Leslie Pat Cabling saying, can I start uh, proceedings for machine learning conferences? And she said, yes. And this is the first so again, community comes up again, that we got together a bunch of Gaussian process people. I actually had to reconstruct this website. It doesn't exist anymore, but I found the HTML um, to sort of show what the websites looked back in, 19, in 2006, to get together and discuss the challenges of deploying these things in practice. Because something that always stuck with me, and I realized only about 10 years ago, is not the same thing for most machine learners, is I was interested in machine learning for solving problems. So I had a set of problems on an oil rig, and I was interested, can machine learning help solve these problems? So this workshop itself, Gaussian Process in Practice, is trying to reflect that. And I was really enjoying Shakir's talk this morning, when he basically was talking about the same thing. And he was talking about that dynamic interactions between the problems you solve and the way they affect society, and the way that society's problems should affect the way you think. And that, to me, has always been at the heart of the way that I was approaching machine learning, which is why that meeting was about how you deploy Gaussian processes. Shortly after that, a book uh, came out, which um, I think is, was a really massively important 
thing for the community, a book that summarized the knowledge the field had so far. And I put it alongside uh, Thomas Kuhn's book on the structure of scientific revolutions, which is a 1960s book that talks about paradigm shifts in science. And it talks about how those paradigm shifts up until the 19th century used to be represented by the writing of individual pieces of scientific work, like Newton's Principia. That changed the way people thought. And then he reflects the fact how in the 19th century, that shifted to textbooks. So current thinking was reflected in textbooks that were being used to teach. And then I was wondering what represents a paradigm today. And I was thinking to myself, more than anything else, a community represents a paradigm. And where textbooks emerge, they're just the observed variable from the latent space of what that community is thinking and doing. And that's why it's so important that we're all together here today talking about these ideas. And that's why AI Stats itself is such an important conference. Because the other thing that sticks in my mind from this period is that the first paper then, Andreas will go through this history a little bit, that fed into this work, which was on, uh, called Ga Bayesian Gaussian Process Latent Variable Models, was actually published at AI Stats 2010. And that's an important AI Stats for me because that was the first ever one in Europe. And we brought the conference to Europe explicitly, a group of us, myself, Bernard Schulkopf and others, to make sure Europe had access to that community. And it, it, the 2013 is actually the American edition of the conference, but I'm really pleased that we're doing this one in Europe, so I can sort of mention that. Because, of course, communities are spread across the world, but it's so important to have something locally. And when we think about that, let's not forget that there are still many continents that don't have access, easy access, to the type of capability and meeting that we're having today. So with that, I'm going to pass over to Andreas, who's actually going to start sort of saying, so I'm saying, oh, we were just all fun, having fun together. And Andreas will talk a little bit about the technical side of the work. Excellent. Uh, you will see more of Neil uh, in the end. He has some slides. But, um, before proceeding, uh, I want to make a small parenthesis to say I'm very grateful for this award. ASTAS is also my favorite conference. And this particular work is very much in my heart. It's the basis of my PhD thesis. Um, also, I'm very grateful to Neil. I did this as part of my PhD. Um, I loved your, your presentation, by the way. Uh, I didn't know exactly what you would speak about. It was a bunch of photos that I saw in the slides, but amazing. Um, so in the spirit of uh, the, the, the things that Neil talked about, about community, uh, the, the group effort, and so on, my bit is going to be a little bit more technical, but I'm also going to speak about all the related ideas to deep Gaussian processes, what came before, what came after, and explain these things a little bit. So um, I'm not going, going to do an introduction to deep Gaussian processes. There is plenty of tutorials out there, but I'm going to do a bit of the lazy, uh, quick introduction just for those that are not familiar. And this is by starting with a neural network, which I have here on the left. Uh, you have some input x, this goes to some nonlinearities and there is some weights that have single value parameters that one optimizes and with appropriate multiplications you get the output. Now a Bayesian neural network, one can think of it as replacing the, um, these fixed parameters with distributions. And going from neural networks to Gaussian processes can be thought of um, looking at the limit of infinite units. So intuitively one can Thing about functions as being infinite dimensional vectors. So having infinite units here, uh, we obtain a Gaussian process, which is basically a distribution over functions. And the inference is also done directly in the function space. So notationally, we say that F um, has a Gaussian process prior, depends on a kernel, which is a nonlinear function acting on the inputs. And uh, this observation about the limit properties was first done by uh, Neil in, uh, in uh, 1995. Um, since we agreed that we are now talking about functions, I will also use the notation where f is the instantiations of f of x in the particular data points, or I can, we can just say that between inputs x and outputs y, we have a function f. Right. So a deep Gaussian process intuitively is easy to understand. We can just say, well, let's stack these things one on top of the other. So we have now x to be our input, and we model this by saying, F of, a, F of F of F of F and so on of X, where each F is a Gaussian process, it's a stochastic process. So that's what, what uh, we initially talked about in our um, ASTAS 2013 paper. 
This H1 and H2, now we can call them intermediate layers, bottleneck layers, latent variables, and so on. Basically, they are the noise corrupted outputs of each layer from the previous GP that feed into the next Gaussian process. Now, the motivation around that is that we want to relax assumptions of global smoothness uh, that comes with a single layer Gaussian process. One can see that in this plot here. Um, so we have a step function. We have some observations from the step function. We can use those as training data. Is these little um, x's here. And we have observations only on zero, on y equals zero and y equals one. With a single Gaussian process, obviously that's very hard to model because they are global smoothing machines. So if we take samples from the uh, posterior that I represent as uh, semi-transparent um, red dots here, we see that these samples are all over the place and predominantly in between zero and one because they, they, uh, of, of the way that they smooth the, the space. And if instead we use the Gaussian process with one or even better with three layers, we can see that it learns very well this um, uh, non-stationary and uh, particular, let's say, structure in the data. So the, the, the three-layer deep Gaussian process model learns that um, there is like um, data in the y equals one and zero regimes with very few or no jumps between. Of course, that's all easy to say uh, when about constructing the model, but the tricky part is about propagating uncertainty, which is crucial because Gaussian processes are stochastic processes, and a deep Gaussian process has to be a composition of stochastic processes. So propagating uncertainty is, is crucial, otherwise we you just don't have a deep Gaussian process because it's not stochastic anymore. But that's not easy to do, because as you know, if you have an input distribution, which is uh, a Gaussian potentially, and we pass it through a nonlinearity, which is the nonlinear kernel of a Gaussian process, then the output is very much non-Gaussian, and it's, uh, it's, it's in fact difficult to, to infer. Um, so it's crucial to, to, get, to, to tackle this issue before we, we start talking about deep Gaussian processes that are actually stochastic, composition of stochastic processes. Um, I will come back to that uh, in a little bit, but the high-level idea is that in our work, we used um, advances from the interpretation of inducing points as variational parameters. So before getting to that, what is an inducing point? So if we have uh, the inputs H and, and the F to be the F of H outputs model as a Gaussian process, which is here at the posterior shown as a, bl a blue line with associated uncertainty, then because we have a distribution over functions and we can do like posterior inference, we can fantasize as many inputs and outputs we want. And we can say that H tilde and the corresponding U is just one pair of those. Now, this initially has been part of the inducing point literature where people were trying to speed up Gaussian processes, but it has been shown and we have used them in the Gaussian process context that we can use those to induce tractability. So with inducing points, the information in the F of H is compressed in these variables u independently of h. And h is this tricky part that in the deep Gaussian process has a certainty from the other layers. So in this way, we, we can do basic uncertainty propagation. Um, let me speak a little bit about how, how we reach this point and what is the related ideas that come before that. I, I don't have the visual effect. You can imagine it if you squint a little bit. Um, so there is two lines of work, um, that I, roughly, right, that, can, uh, that have led, in my view at least, to deep Gaussian process and what came after that. One is around modeling, or one is around approximations. So since 2003, and potentially even before, people were thinking about warped GPs where in this particular case, the outputs of the Gaussian process are warped non-linearly before going to a regression or classification layer. And then um, uh, Neil Lawrence, 2004, introduced the Gaussian process latent variable model, which was yet another 
important modeling milestone where we say, well, the inputs can also be unobserved and can be inferred. And this would be latent variables in that case. And even since 2007, there was like this idea, well, let's stack GPLVMs, but in that case, there was no assertive propagation. That was a hierarchical GPLVM. Um, at the same time, there was also inducing points for sparse GPs literature. It was very rich, many approaches. I have just a sample um, here. But in 2009, uh, teachers showed that uh, the inducing variables can also inter be interpreted as variational parameters. And this led to the Bayesian GPLVM in 2010 that Neil already talked about in ASTAS 2010, where the idea was like, um, we, we can get a new model, the Bayesian GPLVM, because the inputs now are unobserved and they can have a prior distribution and we can propagate this prior distribution through the nonlinearity of the Gaussian process by using basically the, the, the trick that I mentioned here that, um, that has been introduced the, um, in the Bayesian GPLVM. So after that, soon we used, we built basically on this trick to, um, to promote the literature and to reach to the point of deep Gaussian processes. And many other works that followed that uh, focused on scalability and even more importantly on various approximations, how to make the approximations better of propagating uncertainty. Um, we talk about the inducing points. Technically, the graphical model will look a little bit like that. And depending on how we treat the variational distribution on U, because we do variational inference, as, as I mentioned, the inducing points are treated variationally, we can have distributed computations, which is uh, shown in these two papers from 2014, or we can also have fully parallel inference in the style of uh, SVIGP. Um, SVIGP is a milestone, in my opinion, uh, for Gaussian processes because it showed how to do fully parallel inference Gaussian processes. And by combining the ideas that I discussed so far with the SVIGP ideas, one can also do parallel inference in uh, deep Gaussian processes. As I said, there was a lot of work on various approximations for deep Gaussian processes. I don't have time to speak about all of those. I actually gave a keynote in 2017 about this topic. Um, but you can see it ranges from uh, amortized with neural networks, EP, um, and, and other things. I want to particularly stay on this specific approximation. The paper was not only about the approximation, but let's start with that. It was uh, Hugh Salim Ben and Mark Dazenroth's paper in 2017 where the idea is that we can actually s sample through posteriors on, on the function chain, Q of F for all the Fs in all the layers where F is a GP, to maintain a layer coupling. So without going into the details, the, uh, the, the, the posterior, the variational posterior would look something like that. And as you can see, we don't have these problematic terms H, which is these latent variables that have a certain on their own and they're the noisy um, uh, corrupted intermediate outputs. This we can call them bottleneck layers and they uh, need to be normally initialized. Uh, we, we need to put a variational distribution of those that is initialized, but here we don't need to do that. Um, of course, this can sometimes have trouble with modeling heteroscedastic noise because in that case there is no um, noise intermediate output and this can be shown in, in these plots here that the doubly stochastic variational inference of this paper with the uh, originally proposed mean field inference, this can be fixed potentially by including noise variables as addition or concatenation. But the, the, the important uh, point that I want to stay when it comes to this paper is that it makes the model more practical and it has been a very popular approximation choice for the software that have been built for deep Gaussian processes. Because we don't have these bottleneck layers and we don't have the variational parameters that come with that, we don't need to initialize them. And this made the, the approach very practical. The, and when it comes to a function approximation, the authors also showed in the paper that it beats various regression classification baselines and so on. Um, in my view, from here also, one can imagine two, two uh, general lines of work. One would be more allow, uh, around emphasizing the latent variable aspect with all the intermediate um, latent variables and so on, and the other would be focusing on the function learning uh, or, or combinations of both. But I, I want to differentiate to point out that uh, one could envisage also a case where we have uh, used domain knowledge to construct a deep architecture, 
where intermediate, observed, fully observed, partially observed layers are stacked accordingly to what we think makes sense from our domain knowledge, and then use Bayesian deep Gaussian process inference to compress in these latent, fact, latent variables um, distill information about all the observation spaces. One could think about that as being um, a, a nonlinear, deep, multi-view extension of factor analysis. So we'd have these factors that nicely um, I, um, contained in them, segmented the information from all the different modalities of the different observations we have put around the layers. So I think this is very powerful. Um, and going back to the software and uh, leaning to what Neil was talking about uh, related to the community, it was really nice to see the community uh, embracing the idea and wanting to, to, to uh, experiment with deep question processes. People build their own packages. Some of those became uh, very popular. So here I show just a selection of software built for deep question processes. Um, the first three, I think one could say they're a bit closer to um, to parts of probab general probabilistic programming languages. GPFlex in particular is interesting one because it's, in, in, in my view, it, it looks a little bit like a probabilistic programming language um, based on, on deep Gaussian processes. And talking about applications, the, 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 there is a variety. I don't have time to speak about everything. Um, but in this slide, I try to group a little bit uh, what uh, people have been doing in practice with deep Gaussian processes. One can see that in uh, engineering and in disease identification, there has been a lot of activity. In my view, this is because deep Gaussian processes allow the modeler to bring in their domain knowledge and allow them with very few data to learn to perform training in these scenarios, which is exactly the scenarios that appear in, in engineering, in disease identification, and so on. Here's an example uh, where People have used, that was Vincent and Al actually, have used the Gaussian processes to model hurricane structures. The original data is shown here, and, and the Gaussian process with one layer struggles because of the smoothness, but with a deep Gaussian process, uh, the authors explain how layer one captures low frequencies, while layer two focuses more on the hurricane structure, and the combination gives a relatively accurate prediction. This is from um, our paper in 2018, where deep Gaussian processes have been used for multi-fidelity modeling. And here I want to make the point also that the way that asset propagation works in, in, in these Bayesian models also allows to, um, to learn in situations where maybe normally with machine learning it, it wouldn't be um, possible with, with the, the existing tools. Uh, in, in this case, with a deep multi-fidelity modeling, we show how um, modeling of infection rates can be done. So the high fidelity data would be a few samples from this figure here, which is 2015 infection ra rate data. And because we can assume that in a realistic scenario, we have very few of those observations because they're hard to gather, which are the red points here, we can complement those with low fidelity samples, low fidelity observations, which we can assume that in practice we can have many of. In this case, we can consider that from 2005 we have a lot of observations. So we can combine um, learning a function from the high and the low fidelity data through the deep multi-fidelity approach, and you can see that we get a relatively accurate reconstruction in the high fidelity space. Um, there is a lot of derivative and related models. Uh, again, I don't think I have time to speak about all of those. There is things like recurrent DGPs, convolutional DGPs, uh, DGPs over graphs. Recently, I also saw a paper about connecting deep Gaussian processes to transformers. It's a non-exhaustive list, obviously. Uh, let me see how I'm doing with time. Yes, I'm almost there. So um, the, now there is a question, what does depth buy you? I talked a little bit about hierarchical feature learning, um, basically how can we introduce feature learning in Gaussian processes, which as David McKite argued, it's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater if we go to the infinite um, uh, limit, because then we just obtain a smoothing function. So limit properties can help us study these models. So 
David Mackay, as I said before, showed that uh, if you have a neural network with one layer, you can imagine the first three nodes here to be neural network, that's equivalent to, the Gaussian, to, to a Gaussian process. Uh, if we imagine the bottom three layers to be a neural network with one layer, that's again, of course, a, a Gaussian process. So what happens if we consider deep uh, neural networks? Are they deep Gaussian process? Well, it turns out that no. In 2018, it has been shown by Lee uh, et al. and Matthews et al. that even deep neural networks in these limit properties and some other mild assumptions also converge to Gaussian processes. So, in a sense, uh, a deep neural network can converge to the Gaussian process, but we know that a big deep Gaussian process is a more general class of functions than Gaussian processes. Um, it's, it's not a Gaussian process anymore. So we need to understand what is this extra uh, bit that we get. Um, there has been work on theoretically analyzing deep Gaussian processes. Um, one key insight that has been showed by uh, Duvenot et al. and Dunlop et al. is that the degrees of freedom reduces across layers for very deep models, but for deep Gaussian processes this can be fixed um, through some structural changes. And here we have again the Salim Benin Dyson of paper where they use identity mean function or can connect the inputs, uh, the, the, the top level inputs to every intermediate layer. And there is also ergodicity analysis. So the Dunlop et al. made the observation that the deep GP samples can form a Markov chain across layers, so we can study their codicity and also can do convergence analysis. Basically, when do we stop gaining benefits by adding more layers? There is pack vision bounds, and also recently, Tutor Duar et al. showed that we can build a deep Gaussian process layer with a mean that resembles a, exactly a neural network layer. So that's a really nice equivalence. So I pass it back to Neil. Thank you. Thanks, Andreas. And, and I was just thinking that, um, as well as this award, which is sort of like formalization, I was feeling a little bit emotional just sitting there. Uh, because I think the thing that we can all most feel most proud of is when we see that our work has been picked up by people we really respect. and those people are building on it. And to me, that's one of the most exciting things that you see. And uh, it was so nice to sort of see Andreas summarizing all those people. But part of that, I think that the story doesn't finish there because the question is, how do you forge new communities around those groups? So one of the things that we did in 2000, well, the, the original story of this is that we went to Columbia in 2013 with the Gaussian Process Summer School, and then we started teaching it in uh, Sheffield in 2015. And this again was about community forming, getting people together who had sets of problems who wanted to use these tools. I, I had a sort of epiphany moment in 2013, cycling home in Sheffield, that if I just stopped developing new methods and just tried to teach people about existing methods, that might be a more useful use of the second half of my career um, than trying to invent a bunch more methods. Uh, that, probably continuously true. And so the Gaussian Process Summer Schools was sort of an example of that. But I think that there was also a sort of an awareness, um, and, and they're still going, that the 2023 will be hosted in the University of Manchester, um, being run by Maurizio Alvarez. And uh, the, the thing I love about them is they are trying to bring the applications together with the methodologies. So you can see the theme that's emerging from Andreas's work and Andreas's talk is the ability through this sort of decomposition of algorithm, people worrying about inducing approximations, how to propagate the uncertainty to, through with the flexible possibilities of Gaussian process models that allow people to express their understanding of a problem, transferring all the way to application so that you're going all the way and bringing a community together in the way that, that Andreas brought those threads together. But at about the same time, um, I certainly feel that people like David Mackay and, and many of those others who were a great inspiration for me were a real reason that I uh, worked on these things. And we were very inspired by um, work that uh, Ernest Mwaze and John Quinn were doing in Uganda, uh, doing machine learning and data science uh, in the deployed field. And my postdoc, uh, Shiromania returned to Kenya. So one of the things we next did, uh, Andreas and I went to Kenya in 2015 with Shira and John Quinn and others who'd been working on some of those uh, projects uh, to start uh, a set of summer schools that were formed along the same lines of Gaussian process summer schools uh, that is now the basis of Data Science Africa. And I should say, none of us are involved in it, in the administration of it now. What we did is we, we helped teach and understand how you can build a community 
and now that community has its own legs and, and runs itself and I'll, I'll be going again in May but I go as a participant to enjoy the community rather than because once you have a community like that you start realizing the sub problem sets that they generate are far more interesting than anything one would go and tell people to generate because there's so many interesting things about the African ecosystem in terms of lack of existing infrastructure means that data-driven solutions can do an enormous amount more to bring benefit in health and agriculture and all these areas. So that in itself became very inspiring for us because one of the bottlenecks that we noticed was that the challenges people face in that ecosystem are not around implementing a particular machine learning method or implementing an app on a mobile phone, but they tend to be the challenges around systems. So at around that point, shortly after that, uh, Andreas and I went to um, Amazon and we continued to work on um, uh, these methods there. But a major reason for going was to try and understand how you build and deploy large scale machine learning systems at the time. This is using a deep Gaussian process to do the thing it's just doing, which is transferring from vertical lift to horizontal lift. And the reason it's doing that is the multi-fidelity approximations that Andreas was talking about can be used within the context of, and we've also done this um, with Formula One teams, within the context of uh, combining simulation from uh, uh, wind tunnel data with simulation from computational fluid dynamics with actual flight data to get an improved picture much like you saw Andreas showing uh, with the uh, disease modeling in the um, in sub-Saharan Africa to uh, get a better understanding of how something should perform and in these type of test scenarios you're often very limited on the amount of data you can acquire if you have an enormous amount of data you can just knock yourself out use a deep neural network whatever and, and we definitely also did that um, but as I say the main reason for going there was to try and oh my goodness starting all over again um, the main reason to go there was to try and understand what the solutions were oh. <laughs> Right, I have to click off the side. There we go. Main reason to go there was to try and understand how are people deploying these machine learning systems at scale? Because as I say, the challenge you saw in the African ecosystem is not to do with can a bright student pick up a machine learning model, acquire a data set, pull those things together. It's how do you put the whole thing together to provide a machine learning system? And this is exactly what Shakir was talking about this morning in terms of runtime validation of these things. And I think one challenge we face as a community is we do not talk about this enough. Because in order for these things to be useful, they have to be deployed in practice. So um, you might think that companies like Amazon have all this solved. They do not. And unfortunately, they're not looking at the right time of time frames in order to solve it. Because large companies tend to be quite short-termist in their deployment. In academia, we don't tend to find this exciting. Because it tends to be things like good software engineering, good systems design. Um, so we don't tend to get publications out of it. But so since coming back to academia, the main focus uh, of the group has been on um, how you deploy machine learning systems. And you might think, well, what's that got to do with deep Gaussian processes? Well, one of the major things we're interested in is if you do have an existing system where you've got a composition of components. So in this case, this is an example inspired from a supply chain ecosystem, a demand forecast combining with a supply forecast, combining with cost-based predictions, combining with a purchase order system. And you need to compose all these things together. And you want to ask counterfactual questions about whether you're composing them in the right way. Doing it with your production system system is way too slow. So what you do is you introduce emulation, you introduce machine learning systems to look at those subcomponents. And if you have a good way of doing emulation that allows you to compose those emulators together, then you've got a much more powerful approach to running what we sometimes think of as a shadow system of your underlying production system. And this is with all with the aim of reducing the number of staff it requires to maintain and explain a large deployed machine learning system, because that's a major barrier to say, for example, two master students from Kampala designing, building, and deploying their own Uber-like ride-sharing system for the local Boda Boda taxi drivers. That's where the barriers are, that maintenance and explanation of the system. So th that's kind of been the inspiration, but, and then it's got this sort of deep Gaussian processes as a potential way. We haven't got all this together. It's a very big project, but we think this is a very plausible way of imagining how to do these things in practice. That and combine it in with a bit of causal modeling and causal emulation, as we call it.
So just in terms of software, again, I think the other thing that we're really interested in, it relates again to what Shakir was saying, in terms of benchmarks, I think we're in an appalling position in terms of deep models that propagate uncertainty. Because the advantages of doing this in practice tend to only emerge in deployment. And the sort of benchmarks where we say, oh, I just tried it on this data set, I just tried it on that data set, don't actually reflect the sort of utility of these sort of uncertainties. So who's to know whether it's deep Gaussian processes or deep neural networks or some other formalism that's the right way of going? I assure you, we certainly don't know until we start deploying those methods in practical applications. And I mean that sort of complex application like flying drones or whatever else. So this piece of software that we started on when we were at Amazon, but we've taken it out of Amazon and continue to develop it now, it's called EmuKit. And this is about trying to bring these type of emulation approaches together with complex real world simulation type ecosystems um, in one sort of software package. So it does things like Bayesian optimization, Gaussian quadrature, sensitivity analysis, these sort of things, but it's actually designed to be extended so to be a sort of platform for operating with these models that propagate uncertainty. So to sort of go all the way back to the sort of beginning but with these images flicked around, um, I don't want to work in oil field anymore, uh, I'm not a, <laughs> but um, I think my inspiration personally for getting into the field was working in engineering domains. I was a mechanical engineer as an undergraduate. I did not start in machine learning because I wanted to solve intelligence. I wanted to solve practical problems that I saw people facing. Um, and I really think that where we've seen that they're, they're certainly not a universal solution, but I think that they provide a really interesting tool in that toolkit that we require to solve these real world problems. And I think one of the things that makes me proudest of the work that uh, Andreas delivered is when you look at the breadth of application areas where people are deploying these methods in domains where it's quite hard to use the sort of classical methods, the, the sort of deep neural network things because of due often with scarcity of data. Um, so that was the plan. And then I just wanted to know, Andreas said this is a, a slide slide he put in at the end without telling me. This was the group of us that took those techniques. And again, I like it because Andreas now has longer hair. Uh, and I start, we started off with me having longer hair, that when we, we took the technology um, to Amazon and, and deployed it there, but now with all that experience, come out of Amazon again and deploying it in the real world. And thanks there, and I hope we've left time for some, we want good time for any questions, and I think we've got that. So uh, we'll stop there. Um.